Bird, 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 bird! Feeling, I'm feeling spry. Hey everybody, it's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. It is February the 1st. Man, January is gone. Johnson, I was gone most of January. I feel I'm only going to be home for a couple more days and I'll be taking off for North Carolina, heading down to Rusty Gun Kennels. And uh, Tyler from B3 Podcast is coming down with some of his Patreon listeners and mine. We're going to shoot a few birds, drink a few beers. And then Tyler and I are going to get in the truck from there. I'm going to show him Beer Mountain, the famous Beer Mountain in the Shenandoah Valley. We're going to spend the night there. And then we're going to drive all the way up, crash at my house for a night in Michigan, and continue on to Pheasant Fest. That's right, Pheasant Fest, Minneapolis. Don't miss it. Okay, I'm going to go into that a little bit later. <clears throat> you know, something jumped at me. Um, I was talking with another buddy of mine, and he goes, do you read your iTunes ratings and reviews? I said, I have. I, you know, I'm going to be, tell you I'm morbidly curious sometimes, and I don't care if it's a four or a five-star rating. It doesn't, you know, my, none of my sponsors have ever said, you know, if you, if you ever drop below a five-star rating, we're going to have to pull our funding from you. So that don't happen. But anyway, he told me to read this one, and I found it here. Okay, this guy goes by the name of the Flannel Flyer. I, I have no idea what that means. I could put all kinds of connotations to that. I'm going to let that one alone. But anyway, this is what the Flannel Flyer writes. 30% of each episode is advertising. Well, I'll give you that. If I only did a 60-minute episode total, every once in a while I've gone 20 minutes and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so what? Okay, so he took a star off, I'm assuming, for that. All right, then he goes, great podcast if you like the sound of a dude drinking beer and smoking cigarettes into the mic. Okay, okay. I mean, why is he listening? I mean, he's obviously listened to more than one podcast. I don't, I don't get it. I mean, everybody knows that's what I do, okay? And here, I love this part. Host consistently has little input on the material covered. Seriously? I mean, some people accuse me of talking over the guest or intermittently throwing in a fact that I shouldn't have thrown in. Little input. I, I usually have too much input, okay? But that's even another one. And then his last comment, unprofessional overall. Well, let me just scroll back up to the top of iTunes. Now, if you go to iTunes and you give me a rating review, do whatever you want to do. I, Christ, I mean, we could always use more good ones. Eh, but you know what? I think it's fun reading the bad ones, too. But if you go up to the top of iTunes, it's got details, ratings, reviews, and related. So you hit the detail button. And, and the flannel flyer has probably never done this. It says, the Hunting Dog Podcast is a series of interviews with friends, family, and industry professionals, all related to the world of hunting with dogs. Expect minimal good information, lots of stories of past hunts, and opinions that are not necessarily those of the management. If you can't tell by that little detailed paragraph, that this is supposed to be as fun as hunting with your friends, I got a feeling nobody hunts with the flannel flyer. I really, I got a feeling he started a podcast and all of a sudden he realized like no one's listening. I mean, that's it. That's all I can say. Anyway, let's get on with it. I love it. So please, hey, do an iTunes rating and review when you get a chance. Um, you know what? I, I love it. If, if it's a bad one, let it fly. Okay? I don't take them down. I don't report them to iTunes. I don't care. I love you girls, and I love you guys that listen. <clears throat> and I hope you love each other. And I hope you had a great season. I did. You're going to hear the second part of my Kansas trip with, uh, we're going to go in some deeper, deeper detail. Justin and I, I doubled back to the kennel, and two days later, I had a few questions that uh, we still didn't get to. I was under a little bit of time constraint on the other episode. So I brought those questions with me, and, and then we start talking about the, 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 the real Kansas, the real hunt, and how it went. You're going to hear all my screw-ups and, and Justin's screw-ups. and it, it, I, 
I got done doing that interview or that I, I, it was really more of a conversation. You know, we just tried to keep it on point. And uh, so you're going to enjoy this one. There's a, and we kind of dive with one of the questions. We just kind of drag it into a lot of other f- a lot of other pieces of the puzzle when it comes to training dogs. But, you know, we have to thank my Patreon patrons first and foremost. And let me tell you something. We've got this hosted hunt coming up down in, uh, in North Carolina. It's pretty much close to Lillington, for lack of a better, better term. And um, I had a very, I, I had a couple of patrons picked out. I've uh, been a patron for a long time. Him and, and uh, there, there was two of them going to come down. And they had to cancel. Okay, last minute, that ha- happens to me. I've had, a, I've had a cancel judging assignments and call 40 judges to get somebody who can fly out and save my bacon. So that's not a problem. But the point I'm making is, if you're a Patreon patron, and I've got your list, but I am not going to take the time, and I don't have the time between now and then. I figure this is going to get out faster than I can. If you're a Patreon patron and you live anywhere near Lillington, North Carolina, or you want to drive there and you want to shoot some birds with me and Tyler Webster from from Birds, Booze, and Buds, and if you want to meet Scott Caldwell from Rusty Gun Kennels and hear stories of, uh, uh, he wasn't a Green Beret, Special Forces, whatever it was, you know. Anyway, we're going to be down there, and I could squeeze in two of my Patreon patrons or one of my Patreon patrons and their wife or their buddy or their dad or whatever, doesn't matter. Um, or, you know, you don't have to bring a dog or anything. Everything just could be there. We're going to have some fun for a few days. But you're going to have to get a hold of me. Get a hold of me through Patreon because you know how to do it. You've, you've already signed up. You've been giving me money. You've been donating generously. And if you're down that way and you want to come next, this is next Saturday and Sunday. We're going to get together on the 7th. And then we're going to do a little shooting on the 8th, a little bit of shooting on the 9th. And then we're going to leave. I, you know, don't drive across the country to do this. This is, this is a, just a kind of a fun hunt. Scott wanted to do this for, he, he likes Tyler's podcast, he likes my podcast, and he just wanted to do this for listeners. You're going to have to get your own motel. And there's, there's one relatively close, and it's reasonable. It's very nice. Um, you get to pay for a couple lunches. The only thing that would be free is, you know, spending time with us drinking. That's always fun. And... Um, and uh, that's how you, you might have to pay. I think you have to pay for lunch the next day or something like that. It, it's minimal, whatever you want to do. Anyway, so if you're a Patreon patron and you live close to there and you got nothing to do on the weekend of February 8th, write me. And if more than one of you write me, I mean, I don't know how many could live that close, but uh, we'll figure out a way to do a drawing. We'll figure something out. Anyway, there, there you go. Let's get on with it. All right, Pike Gear is my title sponsor. Pike Gear makes technical clothing for the Upland Hunter. They're going to be at Pheasant Fest showing off some of the new clothing coming out this fall, and we're going to have a ball there. Pay attention. They had a big sale. I I doubt if they got any left. They were just trying to close out the shelves, and they're revamping styles, and they're revamping getting the the new line, the the Tongass line coming up. So anyway, they had a great sale. Uh, you, You can still go check out Pike Gear and see if it's still there. If you haven't, if you, what are you feeding your dog? I just got a call. This is, I will, no, I don't have time to pull up the text, but this is the, as they say, on my mother's grave. I get a text the other day from Yanni Putellis. Now, you all know who Yanni is. Most of you do. If you don't, then you don't follow Steve Rennell and Meat Eater and my episodes and all that crap. Speaking of that, I'm going to be on the stage again with him this year, June 4th. And uh, this year, I'm going to be giving a couple tickets away. I get to give a couple guest tickets away. I'll be on stage with Steve, Yanni, Ryan Callahan. Um, not sure who else, but I'm going to be up there like I was last year in Kalamazoo. And uh, we're going to do we're going to tie something into the Rough Grouse Society membership drive, blah blah blah, something like that. <clears throat> and uh, I got two tickets that I can give away of that. But anyway, so speaking of Purina, I got to get back on track here. I get a text from Yanni, and. I'm not going to I'm not going to pronounce I'm not going to say the name of dog food cuz I don't want anybody, you know. Most dog foods are good. But he wrote the name of this dog food. He says he just he just got a hound. They went to the pound. Apparently Steve Steve's family went and got went to the pound and got a dog and then Yanni and his family went to the pound. And Yanni got this it's a gorgeous looking hound. Looks kind of like a red bone walker. 
Um, I don't know how it's going to work out for him for a family dog. Uh, hopefully it's mixed in with something that likes to be around people and doesn't want to go chase bears up in a mountain. But maybe that's what Yanni got it for. Maybe subliminally that's why Yanni got it. Anyway, he sends me this text. And he says, what do you think of this food? I've read some reviews, not all good. And I said, I wrote back really simply and kind of harsh. I said, Yanni, apparently you don't listen to my podcast. And that hurts my heart. There's only one food you should think about giving your dog food, and that's Purina. Boom. Wrote me back, called me later, blah, blah, blah. We got them all set up. Got that new pup on some Purina. All stages is a good one for the age of that dog. Anyway, Onyx Maps. Okay, they are... They're, they're because Onyx Maps is is like is going to be like the name Kleenex when it comes to tissue, right? Somebody says, "Hey, pull up your mapping program." Even if you didn't have an Onyx mapping program, someone's going to say to you someday when you're hunting, "Hey, I can't figure out where we are. I don't know where the property boundary is." Hey, pull up your Onyx, and the other guy's going to go, "Well, oh, I don't have Onyx." He goes, "You know what I mean." Because that's the system you want on your phone to make sure you know where you're hunting, where you're loading your boat in, where your private lines, where your, where your public lines, where your national forest lines are. Go to Onyx. You get 20% off the promo code HDP on Onyx products. And a lot of people used it last year, from what I'm told, because they re-upped, they re-upped this year. Salem Auto Sports. Boy. Hey, Brandon, I hope I'm going to see you out in uh, Minneapolis coming up Pheasant Fest in two weeks. Um, I will have the truck washed. I told you, no gumbo on it, but it looks like hell. I've been using it. i got to take it on this trip. <clears throat> that truck is a solid truck. If you're looking for a clean, used truck, like the one I got from Brandon at Salem Autosports, look it up. Go online, figure out, look at your inventory. Boom, you got yourself a truck, and you don't have to have a brand-new truck payment. I'll never have another one. CZUSA Field Sports is the, is the hashtag I'm using on Instagram now. CZA, CZ USA. I've owned CZs for about, I think the one I have is about 11 years old. It's 20 gauge Bob White. I've got a 16 gauge in the same format, a side by side. And actually, I kind of sold it to a friend of mine in Texas who kind of never picked it up from Beer Mountain. And kind of, I still own it. So, Scott, I might have to talk to you about that. Anyway, um, Check out the line of CZ Sporting Goods. Uh, even if you're one of them guys who like, they got every gun in the world. Their shotgun lineup is second to none. We're going to have some great stuff as soon as hunting, as soon as trap shooting season's open or as soon as I can get out in the hay field and start skeet shooting, you're going to see a bunch of Instagram stuff with the, the two left-handed models they, bought, they sent me. Yeah, I got a 20 and a 12 gauge. And... Uh, and then we're going to figure out what they're going to send me back for, you know, for the spring or for the summer. I'll send those back. And uh, we're gonna, I'm going to shoot the Dickens out of CZs this year, and I hope you do too. I won't be wearing my gum leaf boots every time I'm out in the field shooting my CZ or whatever I'm doing, using Onyx maps or wearing my pike pants. Or, but anyway, I wear them a lot. If you look, I think, no, I haven't posted a picture yet. I sent it to Jack. Um, the gum leaf boots got gumboed. And I'll tell you what. There's something about that solid rubber. You looked at, I looked at Justin's boots, and I looked at my gum leaves. Now, I had gumbo on them, but somehow that rubber, it just doesn't stick to it like it sticks to leather. So there's another reason to buy a gum leaf boot. And don't forget to check out our Jaeger leads and our best shots. That's a little thing I do with Jack, just me and Jack. It's our little, it's our Christmas fun together we do. And we're going to be at Pheasant Fest. We're going to have the leads and the shots. You'll be able to buy. We're, we're going to bring what's left of the inventory because we ordered some more stuff. Um, and you'll be able, right at the Hunting Dog Village podcast booth, which is going to be like six booths. We're going to be a big end cap right by the public land stage. And uh, my buddy Doug Perinkio, <laughs> took me like two years to get that name right. He has soggy dog gear. And it's an online dog supply place, and he's going to have his booth there. And because he did his sales tax stuff all properly, we're going to sell those, whatever we got left in leads and nice shots, come over and see us at the booth and, uh, and then see Jack. And Jack's bringing up Stephen Faust, who can tell you volumes about these boots. Gunner Kennel's going to be there, the world's best kennel, the world's strongest kennel, the only crash-tested kennel. I don't know what else I can say about him. Best, I love a company... In almost all, you know what, at, at this point I could almost say all my companies are, the way things changed up this year with our lineup. I can call the owner of Gunner, Gunner Kennels 
and he'll either answer the phone and say, what's up, Ron? Or he'll send me a text and says, call you right back. Same thing with his wife and his marketing girl, Macy. I mean, how do you get it? And that's the same way it is at CZ when I met all those people. I feel so blessed to have these people sponsoring a podcast, showing you some good stuff, and, and, and having a top-shelf product. Nothing to be embarrassed about there. Wilderness athlete. Now, I've, I, I've changed over. You know I have. I'm, I'm charged up. I'm juiced up. I hit jujitsu twice this week. And, uh, and you know what? I can't, I, don't want, I can't stretch the truth. I don't want to say that I was like, oh, I felt even better. But you know what? I love their products, their, their focus and energy, and their hydrate and recover. But what I really love about them is their canine athlete line, and that's why we're doing this this year. New dog and hydrate and recover. You know, you can't get everything from a dog food. I mean, you can, and you can get enough. Same thing, I could not have, you know, I could not have wilderness athlete focus and energy before I go to jujitsu. I could have some coffee, I could drink some water, but I, I do things to get a little edge, and most people do these days. And I love the fact that they have products for our dogs. The owner is a dog man. He's a houndsman. He's a lion hunter. He said, make this stuff. There's going to be more stuff coming out over the years. I've got some ideas that I've given them, and uh, I think they're going to take me up on a couple of my years. At least they're going to run it up the flagpole because there's some things out there um, that I think a dog would enjoy and could possibly use as well as enjoy. So we're talking. It's going to be fun. Follow Canine Athlete. Their website should be up pretty soon. Try it. New dog and hydrate and recover. And 25% off your first order with the promo code Canine Athlete. That's really complicated, wasn't it? Check it. You can order all your stuff. You can order some for you. Try it for the dog. You'll both be running around. You'll be talking faster than I do. That's one of the other iTunes things I had back here. Let me go back to that one. What was it? Uh, it just says dude talks too fast, so he took two stars off. Dude talks too fast and spends half the show selling his sponsor stuff. But you got me there, buddy. What's your name? Oh, you can't even tell. He, he's not like the flannel flyer. He's even more coded. DDYN01, whatever that is. Um, Backward ammunition. Adam's going to be up the booth. He's going to be with uh, Kelly Haydall, which is the son of the famous Haydall. Duck calls, you know, you know the name Haydall. Well, Kelly Haydall's coming in with uh, Adam from Backridge. They're going to have some ammo there for you to look at. They're going to have some samples. They're going to have lots of information, and they'll have time to talk to you about any of your. You want to talk about especially your non-tox stuff. You can't talk that depth. You can talk in depth about lead loads, but you want to talk non-tox. You're going to, my California listeners, one of my biggest download states, California, every month consistently. You. Guys and girls are stuck with, if I should say it that way, you're stuck with non-tox from here on out, okay? And that means for dove fields, for pheasants, for mountain quail, okay? Check out Backridge. He's going to have some dealers out there this year. Um, there, there are ways. You can go to your dealer. You can go to your gun dealer, and he can, he can contact Backridge Ammunition. He can import. It's not like just because you live in California, you're not, I know you can't bring it in. You can't ship it in yourself. But you can do it through an FFL dealer. And uh, we're going to have some specials. We're going to have a lot of specials coming up this year with Adam and Backridge Ammunition, the craft beer of non-tox ammunition. Speaking of the craft beer, I just had a parent. In fact, I've been talking so fast. Hang on a minute. I'll tell you what, uh, DDYN01. Here, hold on. I needed to take a little break there. Um, and... That's for the, uh, that's for flannel flyer. He doesn't like me lighting cigarettes either. Um, I just had a damn nice cigar that Brent Kroll left in uh, in Kansas. Wow! It, I smoked that thing. I fa I had to go find a hemostat just to hold the end of it. I smoked it down to the point where my nose was burning. That cigar was good. It was like Maxwell House. It was good to the last drop or the last puff. Anyway, let's talk about Pheasant Fest. Pheasant Fest. It is going to be. Minneapolis Convention Center. It's going to be huge. We're going to be there with six of my sponsors. We're going to be at Kitty Corner from the public land stage. I'm going to be 
I'm going to be around. I mean, there's going to be tons of people to talk to. My best buddy, Roof, in the whole world is going to be there like he was last year at our little booth. He loves talking to everybody. And my other best friend, now I say it's funny, you can only have one best friend. But when I spent so many years in Virginia, and I still have my home in Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley, I met a guy by the name of Chip Parkins. Chip is a consummate, what would you say, sports nut? But the only thing he likes as much as his sports is his grouse hunting and his trips with me. He went to South Dakota this year. A few of you might have met him. If you're coming to Pheasant Fest, you'll remember Chip. He is just one of them guys. He, when he shakes your hand and looks you in the eye with them, them blue eyes, man, I mean, there's nothing but honesty coming out of this guy's mouth. And he's going to be there. He literally is coming on his own dime just to meet the listeners and to just to be there. He wants to be at this event. So you're going to meet Chip, Roof, all my other sponsors, and most of them are going to be the principal owners of the company there. It's going to be so cool. Please come out. See us at Pheasant Fest. Um, I don't. I think I can get some tickets, but uh, you know what? I don't know. I don't know if there's time for all that stuff. But anyway, you can go through. Uh, oh, there's. I think you can go through BHA. I think you can go through Project Upland. There's a lot of way to get free tickets, and the tickets aren't that much anyway. It's going to cost you more gas to get there. I don't care if you live just on the outskirts of Minneapolis. It's going to cost you more in gas to get there. So just get the Pheasant Fest. Come say hi. Shake a hand. Meet Roof. Meet Chip. Meet Jack. Meet Adam. Meet Brent. Meet uh, Addison. Meet... God, I can't think of everybody's name. Can't wait. And don't forget, like I said, June 4th, tickets are sold out. But I get two tickets for the Meat Eater Live show in Royal Oak. And uh, I am going to work up some kind of a contest... And it's going to tie in with your RGS, <laughs> R-G-S-A-W-S, Rough Grouse Society, American Woodcock Society membership. So put it this way. If you want to get a pair of tickets to come see me up on stage with the one and only, and I say one and only, there's a lot more. Anyway, there's two other Renellas that I love just as much as Steve. They're not going to be there. But if you want to come and spend time with one of the famous Renella brothers, me, Yanni, and Cal, or old Cal as they call him. You know what? I might grow a mustache for this thing because everybody talks about Cal's mustache. And what they don't realize is between now and June 4th, I could look like Sam Elliott. Okay? And, and Ryan would be shamed to wear his mustache sitting next to me in an auditorium. But anyway... We're going to do a contest. So if you, by chance, live anywhere near Detroit and you want to go to this thing and you're not an RGS member, then I would strongly suggest if you want your name to be pulled out of a hat for two free tickets to the Meteor Live show, you better darn well be an RGS member. That's the only people I'm offering this to. And those tickets are gone, baby. Gone. Just like this intro. This is a long one. Gee, many Christmas. Flannel Flyer was right. <laughs> Bye. Okay, testing one, two. Hey, everybody. Hey, I'm back. I'm ba- it's the next day. Now, you're not going to hear it the next day, but I'm here the next day over at Black Creek Dog Training Center. Got a couple of questions we didn't get to and a, an additional question that came in from my brother, Jason. And we're going to do a little recap of, of the... Uh, the Kansas uh, mud bath we took, or yeah, whatever. What, what we we got to give that trip a name, or those couple of days a name, Justin. And you hit the worst four days of three weeks. And from what it sounds like, for you've been going there for twenty years. I've only seen it like that once before. <laughs> that wet, yeah. And, yeah. So I might be that Jonah that you don't want to bring on a boat <laughs> or on a hunting trip. So anyway, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna tell you all the the dirty details of that later. Uh, a couple questions we have here. One's from Paul. Says, uh, well, he's Christmas greetings and all that wonderful stuff. Uh, I am at a loss with my GWP, who is approximately 19 months old. I am lost with him, even though he's very athletic. But I can tell him 10 times not to do something, and yet he still does, i.e., run off, do his own thing. He retrieves nicely in and out of water almost mastered a beautiful delivery to hand, and I will run him in our novice retriever trials, which this is from Australia, so I'm sure it's somewhat similar to our retriever trials. What have I, 
what I have issues with is his willingness to run off and do his own thing, pay no attention to me, or how much I verbally correct him, or the trouble he gets in when he gets home. <laughs> I only, the only control I have with him off lead is via my e collar, and this is com- and this completely changes his demeanor to almost be sour. Apart from the fact that he's a love dog, but I'm so frustrated with him running off into the sunset, I'm almost ready to send him back to the breeder. Or worse yet, start with a cocker. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> he must be referring to no no taffy <laughs> in the cornfield, which I'm telling you what, I thought about the same thing there for a minute, uh, Paul. Uh, Maybe you guys should just trade dogs. You know, sometimes they say if a dog goes to a new owner, there's just a different uh, symbiotic, and they're like, you know what, I'd like you. Oh, I don't think, I don't think that would Fresh happen. Start. Uh, P.S. Since we. Last spoke, I moved to a 30-acre farm with an excellent dam and other aspects for gun dog training. So he's got some property to work. So what's he going to do with this dog that just does not want to be in the field with him? There's something in there that makes me think a lot of this is he's just letting his dog loose out the back door to go to the bathroom or something and taking off. How much trouble he gets in when he gets home. Mm. Yeah. So a fence, a dog is going to be a dog, and training is only as good as your ability to enforce it. Mm -hmm. And this is not something that is terribly uncommon. A dog, almost all these, especially young pointing dogs, they need some sort of a containment system at home. You can't expect them just to go out and hang out and lay on your porch, especially when they're young. They're going to go do stuff. And so... I think that dog might be taken off on him from home, and he's calling and calling. Eventually, the dog decides to come home, not because he called it, when just when he was ready. Ready. To. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a certain dog today. <laughs> and so a fence is, yep. is the answer for that. Sometimes the solution is not always a training issue. It's a management issue. And I right. feel like, you know, sometimes you can solve a lot of problems with having the right setup for your yep. dog. He's got 30 acres. He must be out in a somewhat rural area right. anyway, so he could fence a portion of that. And then his dog can have that time to and just You don't need be a to dog. fence a lot. We're not you talking really about... You really don't. No. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Just, just a enough. decent run. Yeah, to get some exercise. What would you size the, the size of your run is off the side of the kennel? Oh, I mean, that's... 60 feet? I, I wouldn't know. I would build it bigger than that right, right. for but I mean, home purposes. But, but that's only 60 by just use your 30. Ju- use your judgment. On yeah. that, but you certainly don't need to fence acres and acres and yeah. acres. And if he doesn't want to do a traditional fence, he could do an invisible fence. The sure. only drawback to the in those type of systems is they don't keep anything out. Right. Right. Keep so. things in. And it can also cause a little problem teaching that dog when I can cross that boundary, too. When That's you, your job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you, yeah, can, yeah. you can work with that. Right, people, right. You can work with yeah, it. People yeah. do it all thousands the time. But and thousands I know people, people have deal with that. Like, like, oh, what do I do now? Mm-hmm. You know, dog's afraid to go take a walk with you because yeah. you got to cross that line that's always told him I can't yeah. go there. You take so. the collar off. I like, I like a nice wire fence you. myself. I do, too. A it, real it, physical you, fence. You can keep an eye on it. You know if there's a hole getting dug. And there's all kinds of pretty fences. You, I mean, you could put up a nice thing off of a barn and have a nice place for a dog to stretch his legs, play fetch with him, and put him back in his kennel. I agree. A physical fence is the best. Yeah. But there are an amazing number of people who live in places where that is against township oh, zoning that's true. ordinances. That's true. You cannot build a physical fence in a lot of places now. Yeah. And so your invisible fencing, underground fencing, is your really only answer yeah. to that. So if that is the situation, that would be the first thing i do. So that right. dog has time where he can just be a dog. Mm-hmm. He's not in training. Run like You're a little yelling at me, Run. Blow it out. And then when you go out, okay, we're working together now. Yep. And all of these handling or pattern issues, don't they always seem to come back to the same thing? Check cord, turn signal, Mm -hmm. come when called. Right. Transition to the e-collar. The e-collar replaces your check cord. becomes an invisible cord that's always on them. Mm -hmm. He says... Well, he puts the dog on the collar on the dog, and it changes his demeanor. Yeah. And that is screaming to me of overstimulation with no foundation work. He just right. bad things happen to me when that collar is right. put on me. That's not the dog's fault. No, 
And not at all. That was poor groundwork before bringing the collar in. Right. Taking too big a step. Yep. Maybe resorting to a higher level of stimulation when the dog didn't respond to the lower levels because right. the, the, the training wasn't there. Right. Right. He didn't know what it was supposed no. to mean. And when yeah. you see that, like when I grab a collar and I go to get a dog, they are all excited and going bonkers to get that thing on their neck. Right. My well, turn. My turn. Let's <laughs> my go. Turn. <laughs> okay. If you yeah. see a dog that you put an e-collar on them and their demeanor changes for the worse, you did something wrong. Right. It's not the collar. Um, now, it's possible that the damage is done and that's what it is. And right. not, now he's severely handicapped and how is he going to get an off-leash obedient dog Especially when we had one yesterday, you know, um, if that dog has gotten into the habit of taking off sure. and having fun, you said he's in Australia. Yeah. Who knows what he's doing Jeez, out there? Kangaroos. Just dingoes. He's got some, who knows what he's <laughs> up to out there, getting himself he might have in trouble. He's some having, dingo litters. He's <laughs> having a big old time out there. Yeah. And, and so he, now you don't ever want him to learn to do that. Right. Now the desire to go do that might always be there right it it could should be able to be overcome and depending on what did and didn't happen with the e-collar i'd like to think a dog of a normal temperament if you just okay we're going to take a deep breath here we're going to start over at square one yeah in a fresh place and we're just going to take yeah. this slow and easy. You've and, mentioned and that before, a fresh place sometimes. Is, if you have a problem, that's the first best thing you can do. Go to a different place. Yeah. You're not going to overcome a problem training where and how you created the problem. Right. You know, right. every time you go back, if the problem was with whatever, right. say chuckers in this <clears> field, you're not going to fix it with chuckers in that field in the summertime. Right. You need to kind of clear the slate. Yeah. Fresh start. It's like trying to take somebody to a haunted house and say, you know what? If you spend enough time in this haunted house, you won't be scared anymore. <laughs> you want to bet? You can't get me to go through those things. <laughs> You're still afraid? Oh, my God. I can't watch The Exorcist. <laughs> to this day, if that music, Tubular Bells, comes on, mm-hmm. I go in the other room. <laughs> or get the volume. You're going out I'm to a, the kennel. I'm a basket case. Like I'm a basket case. That's why we get along. I'm a basket case like I, most I, of the I, dogs I, that we have to yeah, handle. I don't know if I helped. I hope I did. Yeah. A couple ideas for him anyways. Yeah. Um, but And don't, if he does decide, okay, we're going to try a fresh start, really good solid check cord fundamentals yep. for handling, and then transition to that e-collar. Overlay to the e-collar. Overlay to the e-collar. Um, I hope he knows this is not, I'm not talking about a couple of weeks. No. I'm talking about several months right. uh, of doing this. Getting this and really good response that you're looking bit. for and, and with that, the check cord. And that's very true of a lot of dog training. And, yeah. and I get some calls from some of your listeners between when we do these yeah. Q&As. And, yep. and one thing uh, I'm continually hearing and is a little surprising to me um, is the guys with their first dog, how quickly they expect things to happen, maybe? Yeah. And how their expectation level is not really grounded in reality of what how dogs are able to progress. Like, my dog's this old, it should be doing and, this. And if you go fast, that means you leave weak links in the chain. <coughs> Um, yeah. So I hope people know just because you're not seeing these tangible results after a couple sessions does not mean you're doing something wrong. Right. You just this is a game of repetitions. And, right. And the goals are reached by, you know, being committed over the long haul. Yeah. 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 No. Hey. And anyway, Paul, keep us posted. Let us yes. know when you got the fence built, and let us know how the check cord goes. Check cord. And wire we should do that dingo when puppy. <laughs> yeah, and if there's any good <laughs> wire-haired dingo puppies, I'll take one. I don't know how the quarantine's going to work on that when they get here. but All right, uh, Bob Otten writes, uh, good to hear your podcast today. Uh, love them as you may or may not remember. I have a Brittany that will be one-year-old next month. We had a light fall but did take him out to a WMA. That's a wildlife management area. Stocked with pheasants uh, and didn't find any birds. I did take him to a preserve where I did manage to shoot a bird over him. He's cool with the gun. 
Except the problem, he gets a bit overly excited after hearing it. And the first bird, he was steady to flush, but then chases, which would be normal, chasing a flying bird. I would be worried if he didn't want to chase it. <laughs> right, yeah. that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And then starts started bumping and chasing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and so I want to, we should clear up a term, bumping. Mm -hmm. So cause sometimes one organization or one testing organization we refer to a bump bird as a, dog, a, a bird that the dog did not have an opportunity to point with his nose. He just happened to be going in this direction and bumped into a bird. It's like deja vu. We, 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 we had this conflict before on an earlier one. I don't consider that a right. bump bird. But, and I, because he's used the word bumped, right. what, what do you call a bumped bird? When the dog is aware of the bird pre-flight by scent. Okay. Okay, he smells that bird. But he Ooh, just, and he's, just and gets and too and close. And yes, exactly. It okay. causes the bird to fly without establishing a point. Okay. What you described, the dog just happens to be running through there, no fault of the dog. Because we got, by the, the third dog, wrong. we got birds all over the yep. place. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it come yeah. right out of a dog's Yeah, that's an leg. inadvertent flush. The right. dog wasn't aware of the bird right. until it was in right. the air. But to bump the bird to flight intentionally, the dog needs to be aware the bird yeah. was there before right. it Right, we up. call that a takeout. Well, it's, a, it's a bump, but... Well, I yeah. mean, I'm just saying, just so, because mm -hmm. I'm wondering when he's saying he started bumping and chasing. Sure he did, because he just got into a bird, and he right. was excited. I've got to go find another one. Yeah. With no pointing, it sounds yeah. like. And a lot of times with young dogs. We'd agree, though, a bump is no point involved. <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> okay. We, that, okay. That we agree on. All right. And um, not uncommon, nothing to be worried about. A dog that's only been into a small handful of birds, if yeah. that next contact comes quickly, Mm -hmm. which very often on a preserve it does. You right. have you sometimes birds in a relatively small sure. area, and he just chased that one. He comes back and smells another one. I sometimes wonder if in that little puppy brand he goes, well, here it is right here. Oh, the damn. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> well, we know it's another bird. Right, but he doesn't. He, he smells the same. Right. And so he runs right in there because he's still in that higher state of mind, that right. high level of excitement. And I advise. I could see that. Yeah, yeah and, for sure. And that's what happens. So his enthusiasm overrode his pointing instinct, right? Which is a temporary window of a dog's life. Hopefully, if yeah, you do yeah. your job, it is right. Um, it, but it's very normal. It's not abnormal mm -hmm. at all. Um, and that's why sometimes I really advise people. You have this feeling with your dog in the field. I call it the invisible rubber band. And when you feel that rubber band getting really stretched, boy, he's not that connected to me right, right now. And right. it's and the cause of that was game contact. Mm -hmm. Don't keep hunting because it can have the snowball effect and things get more and more right. chaotic and out of control. There is stop, take a break, always have a leash on you when you hunt. Never hunt without a leash always. on you. Always. AS, put your dog on a leash and find a little comfortable spot and sit down. And just take five. Let that <laughs> dog mentally settle a little bit. Right. Give him a little water and then proceed with the hunt. Those mm -hmm. birds aren't going anywhere. Right. They're going to be around there somewhere, especially in this but. format. He was on a preserve. Well, the worst thing for him from a training perspective um, and probably a financial perspective is have that dog just clear out the whole field and you didn't really get any more constructive dog work out of your visit to the club. No, no. Yeah, so take a break. And... He mentioned um, getting overexcited, you know, after hearing the gun. And he said the dog's right. fine with the gun, and he gets overexcited about hearing the gun. I don't know if he has enough experience yet for it to truly be the gun. Maybe it is, mm -hmm. but it may have just been the bird and bird alone. Right. But I see dogs that partway through this process are able to maintain their mental composure better you know when it's just the bird but then gunfire is this another layer of excitement mm -hmm. that kind of triggers it should in right, a dog right. that's got drive and desire here's the one thing i found in dog training to help with that do once your initial gunfire introduction is done mm -hmm. almost everybody for the rest of that dog's life or at least the next year or whatever the only time that they shoot is that a bird? Or if they're doing steadiness when the bird flushes and they either shoot in the air or shoot a blank or something right. like that. 
but the guys that kill a lot of birds over their dogs, you know, that's the only time that dog's hearing a gun. For that first year, I will do tons of background shooting. Mm -hmm. Has no, dogs just running around hunting. He's <laughs> at first they stop and look back at you, and I've had walks where I'll shoot a box of shells in the air just during while the dog's hunting. All right, no boom, bird contact. Boom, no bird contacts at all. Boom, boom, boom. Background noise. It totally becomes right. a neutral background noise, and you can see it in the finished product where it's not a trigger for stimulus. You yeah. know, a higher level yep. of excitement there because I've shot so many rounds around that dog and occasionally at a <coughs> bird. It's dropped a bird. Right. But between shooting. It doesn't always mean it's a bird. No. Yeah. That yeah. dog is, and I do this always, always, if it's a dog that I want to be steady to wing and shot, mm -hmm. before I start to actually kill birds right. over the dog, I've shot a case of ammo over that dog. Wow. Just boom, 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 boom. You should see it. Like the <laughs> first time one actually comes out of the sky and falls down, they're like, oh, almost like, whoa. Like, what happened? Never, never seen that before. <laughs> right. <laughs> never but seen by that now, before. you've got them super steady, you yeah. know, and now we can start working on hunting dead and retrieving. Right. It depends on where your priorities lie sure. and your, your what your goals are. But that's the one thing I would do with a dog to help combat that tendency just to say, get hey, over-ramped You're going to hear this a lot while tons we're out in the of, field. Tons of just no neutralization, birds, just background noise shooting. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, he's got his... Uh, NA test scheduled in May, his AKC in March. In the past, your suggestions have been give the puppy time to mature, and I'm sure that's still the case, which it always is. But what would, what would you recommend to get ready for these tests? Well, I, I don't want to go into the like, getting ready for an NA test. It's going to take too long. Um, and I'm not AKC proficient enough, but AKC is like just a, f a field evaluation of your dog. But his last sentence was after... What do I do to get ready for these tests? He writes, keeping him on birds is a given, period. Any specific advice at this time would be really appreciated. Well, I think we gave you good advice just shooting over that dog a lot so that doesn't over. Because in your AKC test, you're going to shoot, they shoot a blank. blank over the blank. And in NA, when we start our hunt off, before we even get to the bird field, we fire two 12-gauge blanks yeah. at an appropriate distance while the dog's running. Well, if... <laughs> I would get some blanks like like Justin said, or some somewhere you can shoot some lead and cheap shells, because I've seen a dog hear that shell in the beginning, and we're not taking his second shot for 20 minutes because he thinks something went down. Just like you said, mm -hmm. he'll see that field. That field could be 400 yards long. He's looking for a bird. So now we're not even seeing a natural search yet. Yeah. All we saw is a dog chasing an echo of a gunshot. So you now you know when we were just hunting, of course, I would never do it in. A real bird hunting environment. No, no, no. I just want to make sure everybody's clear on that. Yeah, Don't. The, the prairie chickens <laughs> might boom, just get boom, up and think, boom. hey, no, I got to get out of Dodge. strictly a controlled <laughs> setup situation. Yeah. But. All right. That was good. I think that's the, the point covering that thing about like a dog getting. I had a dog like that where I could call him back with a gunshot. I've seen that before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you oh, run yeah. into me once in the woods? No. <laughs> back just in the day? like that. <laughs> All right. Uh, my brother Jason Webb, Weber over in South Dakota wrote, wrote me this morning, called me this morning, and I said, you know what, I'm going back to Justin's. And I, I think he had a question that uh, can apply to a lot of people. And it is, uh, my question is, using stimulation for reinforcing the woe command and for recall. Currently, he has a lab. So I, I use stim stimulation for recall on my lab, so using cum so using cum, and when they don't respond, I use the stimulation. I have only stimulated a few times, and they have associated the beep with the collar. So now if they're in thick cover and I want them to show up or pop out, I simply use the low-tone beep. Works great. There's no yelling, no whistles. The question is, how do I use the stimulation with a pointer using woe and recall? It sounds like he would like to be able to have that same tone that same thing that works for his lab work for both woe and recall with his new pointing dog i it's get exactly what he's talking he's mm -hmm. trying to stay silent right and right he, and he wants the stim to be the cue or the tone right okay yeah and with flushing dogs so far it's been kind of a one task thing and uh where that means come to me mm -hmm. 
Um, and now he's stepping into the world of pointing breeds. Right. And there's going to be times where he wants that come back and check in. And yep. then, but now he also wants to come up with a silent stem slash tone cue for the war. Stop. Right. So how's he going to go about it? No, it, this this actually can be done without too much trouble. Um, I think a little bit of this actually was probably the origin for the flank collar or belly band on pointing dogs. Stim right there, so they're changing point of contact. Mm -hmm. Around the neck means turn or come. Around the I've belly heard that. or flank heard means stop. I've heard people talk about that. I don't do that because I don't want to run two collars on my dogs. I, I just don't want a right. collar back there on my yeah. dog. And I've never met a single person who does. Says, yeah, I like never saw one hunting. Collars. I know I've seen no, it in the training and, field. And they run and they rub them raw if you're really running them. Yeah. And I'm not going to start to teach a point of contact that I'm going to change on the dog. Right. You can do it. People do it all the time. Right. There's tons of trainers. It's just that are not something you do. Really good at that right. method there. Yeah. Um, so with the stem. Here's his answer. It's it's low level continuous to come back and check in and momentary means stop. Now you're gonna use verbal and traditional woe training techniques, but when he does his collar conditioning, mm -hmm. he's gonna use the low level continuous okay. to come to back to him. Yep. And then he's gonna use the momentary to stop. And those are so night and day from to what the, the dog. dog. Yeah, you can put a test light on the collar and watch them. They're night and day. Mm. Even okay. Yeah, and so you will. You can condition that dog that um, that little momentary tap always means whoop, park it. But wow. when that low level continuous is on, that nice. that requires an action from the dog. Now what I'm curious of because he seems to be a big fan of the tone. Mm -hmm. I wonder and. I know he could, but he would be. I don't know anyone who's taken the time to do this, okay. myself included. Because how right. many the low levels mm -hmm. are so unupsetting to a dog that right. there's no reason to avoid them. Right. You know, a lot of right. people. Well, I want to like vibrate a or the it's, tone. It's so. It's not punishment. It no. doesn't take anything out of the dog. But I bet you he, if he's a, a a tone nut, I bet you he could do the long do 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 do, do tone. To mean mm -hmm. come back, come back and check me. And I right. tone my wide range and pointing dogs way out there to that. Lets them know I want them to come around because mm -hmm. I don't want to be blaring on a whistle out there or right. hollering. Um, I wonder if he could teach the same concept but with tone. So the long continuous tone means come back and check in, and boop, one beep means stop. I guarantee he could do it if he was so motivated. I'd love to find out. Jason, you got your work cut out for you, buddy. Yeah, well, <laughs> and, and the only reason to do that mm -hmm. is I don't know why he would avoid the lower level stim. Now, I would never not condition the dog to the stimulation because he's going to need the stim sooner or later right. to, to enforce it and back it up. Sure. Where he can go up a little bit in a real tempting situation and the dog understands it. Right. And if he were to do nothing but tone, when you did he go wouldn't have the stim stimulation to rely would, on. Yeah, he wouldn't have that in, yep. in his bag of tricks and that's where you could create confusion in the dog. Sure. So it's not necessary. But right. if he wants to try it, try it. Yeah. And he lives in South Dakota. Yeah. So well, maybe we should go check out his handiwork this fall <laughs> firsthand. You hear that, Jason? <laughs> so for everybody that knows, he has a seven-month-old German short here. So f I, I, love, I love when people write this because I get a lot of emails like this. Um, he, has been the, he has been a real treat. Easiest dog I've ever obedience trained. Took on retrieving like an old lab going after a duck. Natural, I have been told, to a chill. Um, on inner dunk, wait, I have been told to chill. That was, yeah, that's because I went to Bogan High School, everybody. Okay, he's a real natural. I have been told to chill out on introducing scent at this age. It's hard because he's excelling in everything. I don't want to move too fast, and I don't want to move too slow either. If it makes a difference, I am going to enter him in a, a NAVDA NA test, which is a good thing. I think he's one in a million. We all do. And I don't want to short him. It sounds like he wants to get to the next step, but somebody told him to chill when it comes to introducing scent. And I'm assuming that means introducing birds. Yeah, I couldn't disagree anymore. 
I don't know who told him that. I don't right. know why. What I would not be concerned or focused on mm -hmm. is steadiness. Right. But I don't know why you'd be holding off on bird contact. Especially but where he lives in. Take that dog out. Go try and get him into some birds. Right. Yeah. So no when pressure, I, no steadiness, no obedience. No. Have a tracking. Have a nice Garmin 550 on your wrist like I did saved today. Saved you to today. Saved, saved Miller from spending the night in the woods today. <laughs> I really want to. Th I can't wait till you get one of these. You're going to love it. <laughs> it is the bomb. Um, but I told you when you left this building <laughs> earlier, just so everybody knows, I had to actually stay back and do some work, and Ron yeah. just wanted to exercise, exercise Miller. his dogs. Yeah. And I said, hey, man, just so you know, there's a pile of deer out there right now. <laughs> and then, mm, oh, I don't know, for, I, I knew something was up. Because you well, said, I'm just going to run for about 15 minutes. Right. And about 30 minutes went by, I went, oh, man. Something's wrong. <laughs> anyway, let's, uh, I yeah, don't want to drift too far Go back to Jason's. Jason. Um, uh, for, I, I, was, I had the pleasure enough of hunting with him for, for a day after my trip okay. left. And uh, it, it, to me, it's, it's ideal pheasant hunting. He's in bird country. He, well, he's in bird country where they're not conjugated. You know, maybe this time of year they are. He's got a lot of room to run with varied bird contacts. It's not going to be like a preserved, preserved bird or a planted, planted bird. It's going to be on occasion he's going to get into a bird. You know, it's not super dense. Well, yeah, you can set up, but he, if he has that right at his doorstep, the beauty of the, because a lot of your listeners don't have this no, option. absolutely and, not. And that's why I'm going to point out 90 the other percent way. of them, I'm sure. Right. So the guys who don't have that in their backyard and you are using a club, mm -hmm. When you're there for the purposes of dog training, work with the operator and say, here's kind of what I'm trying to do today. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not there to schmooze some business associates and pile. Um, you're, you're there to work your dog. Right. And so you can tell. If you don't tell them, they might throw all the birds in one little area and everything. Say, <laughs> right. oh, here's kind of what I'm hoping to do. Is that right. something you guys can yeah. work with me on? So. Yeah. And I asked you when I got here, and I, I kind of thought I knew the answer because you've never gone on your training hunting trips in the spring. You're always no. up here for spring and woodcock, I'm right? Here. Yep. And uh, I told you, Jason has access to some wonderful sharp tail country. And I was wondering, did you ever meet anybody who did what we do with spring woodcock and grouse, run on spring sharp tails? Because they, would they be paired up, I would think? They'd be not in the family well, groups anymore? Well, no, they... Uh, Right now they're grouped up. No, but they're going to use a lek. So the males are going to gather. They don't pair off like until quail until that happens. Or no, the the male just stays there. The the oh. hen will come to the lek. Oh, okay, so a male and, sharpie and, doesn't and help raise the. No, okay. he's going to. You know, they basically they pick the best dancer, just playing right. on the lek, and then that's why I always got lucky. Which, <laughs> she'll pick which one <laughs> she wants to breed to, and once she's bred, she's off to. Find by, her, herself. By, by herself. So you still get, get flocks of males early. It, w I, I had this picture that they were all off being paired, you know. Yeah. But and every state's going to have its cutoff in the spring. Right. Where, you know, well, there are some that don't, but right. most states are going to have a cutoff. Right. But I've never, I just can't see uh, you doing anything with a dog on, on, on the sharp tails in that environment. It's too open. I know people set up blinds to photograph and right. watch the males dance. Right. They do it with sage grouse and prairie chickens as well. Those are all birds that use leks. Mm -hmm. um, but he shouldn't overlook his pheasants if he's got pheasants around there. Yeah. Um, you know. But you hate pheasants. That's too, <laughs> way too strong a word. <laughs> I won't get back to that. I, I don't hate pheasants. There are certain, we'll get back to that. Yeah, right. I've been accused of that by a lot of, peop, a lot of people along with Not you. Not just me? No, a lot of people. Okay. But the deal with that, if he's working on pheasants post, we'll just call it post-hunting season, mm -hmm. pre-shutdown right. if there is right. a dog ban or a quiet season, um, that really is all about picking your cover. If you have a young pointing dog, mm -hmm. I will take a uh, 80 acre piece of the right kind of grass that might have two Eight. to four pheasants in it right. over the wrong cover that might have 40. Called a cattail slough. Or... Yeah. And or a any of that kind of cover. Um, so it's all about picking the I, right cover for getting. I had some good dog work on this last trip on hen pheasants, but yeah. it was always in certain cover. There were other places that 
it's just isn't going to work. Right. Well, well we we did that. We dog. went to that spot with two flushing dogs. That that's like, right. So this is a this is a flushing dog spot. Okay, so we'll just get this over with <laughs> right now about my <laughs> pheasant, your accusation. Okay, <laughs> I don't mind pheasants when I leave the truck with the intent of hunting pheasants, <laughs> because okay. then I'm going to plan my hunt accordingly. Right. And most importantly, I'm going to select what I feel is the best dog for right. that mission. Yep. Where they get under my skin a little bit is their <laughs> uncanny ability to run interference and completely ruin a hunt for a different species of bird. I have had your, hunts. Your ruined. words were me, to me were pheasants can ruin a good quail hunt. They, and it's they can ruin a good hunt hunt. They can ruin a good prairie bird hunt. And you're just kind of getting in the groove. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, it's like there's a massive vacuum sucking your bird dog a direction you don't want him to go. That's pheasants. That's just what they do. They do. They, and you saw it I on saw, that I, one hunt firsthand. I, I did. We were just getting to the sweet spot. I know. <laughs> yep. And next thing you know, where's your dog? 300 yards over that way. Pointing a couple of hen That's pheasants. That's what it ended up being. Right. Yep. Which I was... Uh, I was not overstimulated. I was not like that dog that heard gunfire and got excited. No. I walked up calmly, and uh, and I pulled up on both birds, but pulled right back down again. Yeah. I I was expecting to quail because that's all we've been talking about. And yeah. I'm like, but you also told me these birds are just not going to be. They're going to be a little closer to what do you call it? Getaway, hideaway cover, escape cover, escape cover. Yeah. But I was still hoping. I was yeah. still hoping they were. Well, we it wasn't a hundred percent out of the question. No, because but I we, look. She didn't end up three hundred <laughs> yards away for no reason. Those right. birds sucked her all the way up there. That's what they do, and that just you know I we were almost to the sweet spot in that walk. If you remember the first half of that walk, I said, really, I'm just doing this part of this hunt just to satisfy my curiosity. And make right. sure. But they're usually, right? And, I go, right. and we were almost we're to almost the usually. There. I was so ready. Yeah, and <laughs> no, pheasants. I was so ready. interference. And it was just as you, pre- and then we're at that point, we we're so damn close I, to the. It, burning time. So the truck. And I had other places I wanted right. to get that day. So they they cost us a covey of quail that day right. is what they did. Yeah. They've been doing that to me their, my for, whole life. For 20 years. So that's when it ticks me off <laughs> is I'm not trying to hunt you right now. Leave me alone. I'm trying I like to, it. Yeah. I like it. So it, Justin was nice enough to invite me out where uh, to Kansas where he spends, well, it varies from year to year. Yeah. It could be a week, could be three weeks, yeah. whatever. But you go out there and with client dogs and your dogs. Mm-hmm. No and guiding. This no, is no guiding. a training trip. Tra- and, and occasionally you might take a bird for the pot, mm-hmm. right? But that is not, that's not even your goal on that trip. Most of the dogs you, I'm running are young dogs. You just want to get that experience out there yeah. in that country. It extends the season for me because it's something productive I can do in January. Right. And here in Michigan, we're done. Right. And uh, so it kind of, especially for the young dogs, I've always felt the first two years are the most critical. Mm-hmm. The more I can give them those first two years, right. I feel like that just really influences what right. I have as an adult dog. And so if I can extend that season by a month and give them that on the ground experience, yeah. it really pays off. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, one of the things I commented to you, if you, if you were to pull up where I pulled up to, to meet Justin, you know, he's got the, what is that, 12 dog, 12 hole dog box? Yeah. It's part of the truck. It's not, it's it doesn't sit, mount. it's a yeah. chassis mount box. And uh, it's about the size of a Schwann's ice cream truck, I call it. Not far off. Uh, yeah. Not far. And uh, so j- the amount of work you do <laughs> when you get there, if it's a bad day, all 12 of them dogs have to come out. They have to go pee and poop. They have to go back in. They have to come back out later. They have to have, you know, the commitment you have to doing that. I I don't know where you can you detest where you got that from because I I looked at that like I would rather go back to that job I had in Virginia <laughs> on my knees setting equipment that I swore and cussed than to stand there 21 days in a row <laughs> and let the dog out the box and and feed him and put him. Where does that come from? It's or do you I even don't think? even it, no. It's it just, just it's just always been part of what I do, taking care of dogs, and, and their care is important. You could probably do it training. blindfold, just yeah, about. Yeah. My God, 
You just can't, and you get into your routine, mm -hmm. and the worst thing anyone that's around can do is offer to help. Which I did. Mess. Everybody does, yep. and it's always with you know good, good intentions sure. and everything. Yeah. But you know. You don't know those dogs. They don't know you. I have and my And you got system. a spot for each you know, one of them. The dogs are always in the same spot right. in the line. Same up, hole in the same, box. Yep. And, and I'm their buddy. I don't want anybody else trying to help me with the dog. <laughs> and so, well, let me tell you. It's, it looks, it's painful for a friend to watch another friend when I'm having a beer and I'm kicking back, having a smoke, and you're still working for 30 minutes. You know? right. um, but anyway, so... Why why Kansas, too? How did that come about? Because it, I'm not saying bird numbers, they fluctuate year to year, you know. Um, there's good stuff. There's good years, bad years, and everything. Why Kansas for you? That started, first trip was 1999. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I picked that state was I had never hunted wild bobwhites. And, okay. And had always read about it, okay. you know, uh, Bob White quail hunting has a, an amazingly long history in this country. Probably the oldest, uh, right there with and rough grouse. Grouse, grouse I would think northeast. Yeah, yeah, and a, a lot of the real avid sportsmen, you know, did both. They right. would they would hunt grouse in the north in the right. fall and quail in the south in the winters yeah, till that one war. And uh, <laughs> so, so that was really how I picked there for Just, no other reason. Were than you on your way back from that one trip? No. That I, wasn't part I, of that was, coming no, home? Coming home, no, no. This would have been two years later. It would have wow. been 99, and I just wanted to go somewhere in the winter that had quail, so mm -hmm. I just did a little bit of homework, and basically you would have the southern tier of counties in Nebraska, mm -hmm. Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas. That's yeah. kind of, I mean, that, they, not that there's none anywhere else. Right, but that's. But a, I think if you're going to make a trip and go, go to the traditional for area. Wild Bob Whites, yeah. that's, yeah, that's where yeah. you're going to go. And so, for no other reason than that, I picked that and just got some Stuck maps to it. and, uh, yeah. Built relationships. Web. And mm -hmm. so, talking about, let's talk about relationships in Kansas. <laughs> so, Justin had told me this. I think on the phone before I ever even drove there, he says, well, if, it, if it, I don't know when you said it, but if, if, if the weather doesn't shape up here, we're only going to be able to drive on the north-south roads. And, and not I, even some of those. And it got, not even, it got so, so bad. Not, not even, even some, even of, some those. of those. Yeah. Now, and you've only dealt with that one other time that bad. No, I mean, we've or, had small amounts of moisture where you avoided Avoided roads. that road, but it didn't affect the whole day bad. or anything. Yeah, and just so people know, it's because a lot of times they don't, a lot of those east-west roads in that farm country are not heavily traveled. And other than, you know, every fifth mile, all the locals know which, if you do need to go east-west through that you Go area, two miles more north. Yeah, that's the one you want to try. And then hop over. And then yeah. there's windows where you don't even try those. Right. I mean, um, there's something in the soil there that uh, turns into gumbo. And you, I don't care what you're driving, oh. or what kind of tires you have. One rotation, we all got the same tire, and that's yep. a slick. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we go, we go, uh, we go quail hunting, and uh, we're out looking for birds. And we get back, and just walking in the field, it's it's killing my knee because just the suction back from the the mucky fields. And we got back onto that east west road to walk back, and I could tell the difference. We we're only off the from road when for we walked out. from when we walked out. Yeah. It still had some firmness to it, boy, and it was going quick. Mm -hmm. And and then I think, did we eat lunch ahead of time? Yeah, we, yeah, we did. We ate lunch ahead of time, and just the amount of foot traffic around the truck while you were again letting dogs out and putting them on all four. We we tromped down that piece of road. It looked like somebody was pouring concrete. Mm -hmm. Only it was dark brown, you know. And I, there was no way I predicted. There's no way you predicted it. I mean, in hindsight, kinda. I. I I knew I was pushing the envelope. I asked, uh, it was the combination of the way that sun was hitting the shoulder. And we finally got a and, full sun afternoon. Full sun for the first time. And the crown of that road. It was very steep, very high. It was, yeah. I mean, it was like a person's bald head, right? Right. It was, it, was, this, it was a heavily crowned road. Right. And I was obeying the golden rule, which is never block a road. Never block a road. And I thought I was just enough. And just right of center. Just right of center. I had just <laughs> enough if, if a farmer did need to get through. 
And I knew we were done for <laughs> right away. Well, the first, we the went f- one inch forward and a foot to sideways, the re- sideways in the rear. In the rear. And then I and I'm the thinking, like, <laughs> did Justin just feel what I just felt? It felt like Sasquatch was pushing your truck from behind, like a giant mammoth came in and just said, I'm going to push you in the ditch the a little driver, bit. Yeah. And then you put it in drive again, and it went a little mm. further. Like, no matter what you did, you're going. Gravity. every piece of momentum, gravity just says, you are done, yeah. you know. You are done. And I think you made about three or four. T- we the attempts was barely an attempt. It was yeah. just, oh, I, at one point, I think you put it in four-wheel drive low. Yeah, which made no <laughs> difference whatsoever. No. So you cannot picture this. Mud now at this point. It's full sun. This stuff, if you were to stand in it and you did not have lace-up boots, you would actually pull your foot out of the boot and you'd be walking sock foot on your next step. It would suck the boot right off your foot if they weren't laced to your foot. And all I can think about is the fact that I've got about seven cigarettes left. (laughs) Okay? And earlier in the day, I made us two sandwiches, two bottles of water, and two cans of Miller Lite. I thought, what else could we need? We could be all done. We had lunch. We got a cocktail before we get back in the truck. This is going to be the best day, last day, best day. And all I could think about was the fact that I got, you're not even in the equation for the beer at this no, point. of course you, not. <laughs> I, already, I already vote. I vetoed you out on the beer. <laughs> I'm like, well, we ate our sandwiches. I, I felt like Belushi and Ackroy in the, in the Blues Brothers, like, we got a half a pack of cigarettes, a quarter tank of gas, and we got to get to Joliet by 5 o'clock. <laughs> and uh, then Justin, you know, we, we know. I mean, we are stuck. This thing, you couldn't get this. If you had the football team, no. you were not going to get this vehicle. On top of the fact that your vehicle is it's heavy. heavy. Yeah. It's heavy. But you weren't going to get any vehicle out of this. No. <laughs> and Justin goes, opens his armrest, gets this little notebook out. It's got all the ranchers and farmers' names that he's built up relationships with for 20 years. And I'm like, Phew. I said, before he made his first phone call, I said, ask any of them if they smoke or drink. Because <laughs> <laughs> we need supplies. <laughs> Actually, you weren't finding it that funny at the moment mm-hmm. because you're like, I got 11 dogs in this truck. We got to get off this road. Yeah. I, I'm, and I'm taking it half panicked. And now it's all funny now. When my first calls went, I'm leaving voicemail. Oh. In my head, I'm starting to think, hitchhike back. You know, which, how much traffic is on that road? Well, no, mm-hmm. I, the road, we, I would have had to walk two miles to right. get to a road. I could grab somebody. Right. And I'm thinking, okay. Go get Ron's truck. Mm-hmm. Throw some dog food in that. Yep. You know, I'm in my head, I'm just a plan. Like, what if? Yeah, Plan know? B. Yeah, right. And then drop the dog food off to you, and one more beer, maybe. And then I go back <laughs> to the house. If you'd have brought my truck, there was a cooler in the back of it, which you would not have thought of. Put it this way: I was in such a panic when Justin came up with the idea to go in to get my truck. I said. Well, don't forget Bravo. We can't leave Bravo there all night. He goes, Ron, Bravo's in your truck in the Gunner <laughs> Kennel. I'm like, good point. <laughs> I, I, was, I was not, trust, I want you to all know, I was not afraid of dying. I was just, like, afraid of being terribly inconvenienced in a manner that I've never been inconvenienced before. When those first calls didn't come through, you had this look like, <sighs> I might have to spend the night out here. Oh, yeah. I was. I looked at your gas gauge, and I knew you. That that one pump in town was running so slow, but you said you had a half a tank, and I was like, "That's going to last us." We turn it on and off you know, as long as the starter holds up. <laughs> so, Justin says, "Well, I'm walking to town," <laughs> and I see him start disappearing down the North South Road, and uh, and shortly thereafter, I see him reappearing. And I was like, holy hell, yes, he's coming back. I know it wasn't because you were foot sore. Because oh, you no. could walk your ass. Yeah. You could walk 20 miles in a day if you had to. And I knew there was some good news coming on the horizon. And, but you at the same time, you're just like, just like when you run your dogs. You're really calm. Mm-hmm. You know, I did see when you finally put it in park. I did hear you have one expletive. That was, that was the <laughs> loudest I've ever heard you talk in the years I've known you. It was one like, damn. Well, you know, 
<laughs> I felt like, you know, I knew better. And, you know, I've right. been poking around there for 20 years, right. I knew better. Right. And I was trying, I was pushing it a little bit to try. I wanted to get back to that area. Sure. And, uh, yeah, and then, of course, been, I don't want to block. You've been this area. I've been area. saving it. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and I didn't, you know, of course, you can't block the road. Okay, well, it feels pretty good under the truck. But mm -hmm. in hindsight, it's like, you know, I could have parked You, you would never do that again in I, a million well, years. I would have went and hunted there again, absolutely. Oh, but I, not I would parked, have parked there. differently. Yeah. If, yeah. In retrospect. Yeah, you would have parked on a basically a busier, better road yeah. and dealt with walking a dog in further and hooking a dog up sooner than you're, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, you would have just deal with that. And the, that would have been, but <laughs> the feeling that went through my, when you came back and somebody had said, okay, um, someone's going to come out and assess it. They're going to see if they could do it with a pickup. Well, our SOS got to the card table. Oh, that's and, right. And, and that's then, right. And then once in a roundabout fashion, right. several texts, several calls. Over at the green mill. Yeah. And that. Feed and, mill. And once I knew that our SOS had reached the card table. Right. I knew we were this as good as home. This is the Friday the Friday afternoon pin, pinochle, pinochle game. Pinochle game. I knew we were as good as home. <laughs> <laughs> you did. <laughs> but I was still looking down at that ditch on my side of the truck. <laughs> it's like... So it's entertainment for them. <laughs> oh God! You know those guys had to be going like, I can't. I bet you the guy who knows you the longest even said, "Damn it, Justin! I just lost a money bet because I bet no, I bet everybody you wouldn't get stuck well, this I, week." No, I had coffee with him the next morning. He said, <laughs> what did he say? He said once in twenty years, that, that's doing pretty good. <laughs> it's doing pretty good. <laughs> it's doing pretty good. Yep. So, but what's his, what's really strange? So another guy, a friend of the friend from the card table, he hears about it. And it was great, this network of farmers, ranchers that I mean, they didn't ask nothing. They just all came to. Somebody's stuck. Somebody they, needs help. They need help. Yeah. And that, that's what I've said that in, in South Dakota, Kansas. You get out in rural America and, you know. You it, have to help each other. You have to. AAA is not coming there. <laughs> no. There's no. I asked <laughs> you if we could Uber out of here. No. And you looked at me like, <laughs> Uber this. Yeah. <laughs> I had to try to keep the levity in. But so. The one guy comes up, and we probably should have, we, again, we should have waved him off. But And we were only 100 feet into this road. If that. If that, right? Yeah. And, yeah, if that. But he saw it, and he thought, like, well, I'll pull up next to him just to Check assess the situation. Yeah. He lives there. Mm -hmm. Why he didn't feel it the minute he started slipping? He did. He did. But. And he just kept coming. And uh, he stopped and talked to us, and he's like, yeah, this is, boy, this is going to need a tractor. He thought, I'll, I'll just jerk these guys out with my truck. What was yeah. the one guy said? There was another guy that said it would do, he loved nothing better than to do what? Oh, pull out a, he's been waiting 20 years to pull out a Ford. With a Dodge. He's a Dodge man, yeah. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. He so almost got stuck. He almost got stuck. Not trying to pull me out. No, no. Just coming to just look. Just coming to look. And they both pulled on that road. Yeah. yeah, and and in fact, the Doug. The, the Doug. Well, Doug was the first guy. Keith yeah. was the second guy. Keith only pulled into that road half a length of his truck. He was stuck there for five minutes. I thought these guys are going to blow their transmissions. Doug took life off that pickup. What he did? Oh to that my truck. God! Yeah. So he's stuck next to us, basically stuck next to us, idling, talking to us. Now he's got two choices. He can try to go backwards a hundred feet, or whatever it is to the intersection, and if he goes forward, the road's going to get worse, but he knows he's not going to have the same kind of get up and go going backwards, certainly won't have the steering control if he goes sideways going backwards. Nobody's that good at, you know, <laughs> except Steve McQueen maybe in that one movie, Bullet, and uh, so he goes, he goes plowing eastward up this road, just throwing, I mean throwing, the, uh, just like a mud race like you see on ESPN. And I said, where's he going? Justin says, he's going to go to the top of that hill, and he's going to turn around. Oh, I knew he, if he kept going, it's only going to get worse. That I road. knew he had to come back. And I'm thinking, he's going, he's going to be stuck 300 yards the other way. That man never left off the throttle on that truck. All the way to the floor. All the way to the floor, top of this little hill. Somehow, 
He should teach cops how to drive or something. At the top of the hill, that truck motor made some noises. Did, I, I'm not a mechanic, yeah. but no one ever wants to hear that noise come it, from under it the It wasn't hood. just a turbo whir. <laughs> no. You know, I've heard that. <laughs> it was a death moan. And then Justin says, let's stay back off the road about 20 feet. Just in case just, this thing goes sideways here. And he comes back down. Now he's revving it because he knows if he slows down, it's all over for him. He's got this thing up to maximum RPM, probably doing six miles an hour and i said he's gonna hit your truck well remember i left just enough room for, for a vehicle, a vehicle, to, vehicle get to get by <laughs> from your original park job <laughs> and apparently when he came back through throwing mud there was just enough room for him to get by you and uh and then long story short uh another guy comes by he gets kind of stuck at the corner doug's in Kunchet. he was going to go get a tractor for us but then somebody else said uh, you had a closer tractor. Closer tractor. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful old antique versatile. If you don't know what that is, look it up on the web, on the Google it. Versatile tractors are center articulated steering, all wheel drive, beasts. Mm -hmm. That tractor did not weigh half of what your truck wore. Yeah. Weighed, I, or if it, it weighed less than your truck. Oh, for sure. It was not a big tractor. When I first saw it, I went. Mm, I, don't I don't know. think so. Don't know. That would have been like bringing a skidster out there. Yeah. We thought we're like, oh, that's not big enough. And this old versatile just walked me right I out. I mean, of there. put and did it the opposite way. Grabbed your bumper mm -hmm. and he started driving to the intersection. Me a and you're like, how's he gonna do this? He just twisted you. It was greasy enough. It was just, greasy. Yeah. <laughs> you said, what do I need to do? Just put it in drive. Put it, just put it in drive. Just is put what it he drive. said. Yep. He needed, <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, he needs me to know. just put it Steer in drive. the wheel this way and uh -uh. make sure. No, he just said, I'm pulling you out of here, son. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that guy had no emotion on his. You know, he was just that old. He, Probably 80 years old. 81. 81. 81. He, just like he was going to yeah. feed the cows. And, and, and <laughs> I tried to give him a little something for helping us out afterwards. Right. And, of course, he refused it. And he yep. said, oh, no, no. This is way better than watching TV. <laughs> is that what he said? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Talk about reality TV. Yeah. We could have filmed. I no. should have filmed that being pulled out. I liked oh. it. I got him out of the house that night. Right. Yeah. He probably, he was probably, he probably would, didn't have his jammies on yet. But it, it was, and this all, it's all came down when we all got back out on the hardtop road. I got a picture of it on Instagram. You'll see the pretty orange sunset in Kansas going. It was the only evening you saw that when mm -hmm. you were there. Yeah. The first morning I was there, I watched the sunrise, red sky at morning, sailor take warning. Mm -hmm. And it was a harbinger of the week to come. And red sky at night, sailor's delight was our last night. And I drove out of there in the morning. Hard as a rock. The roads were frozen, and clear. The the very best, in, in the way that kind of goofed up the dog train in that last week was access. Yeah. I had all kinds of places I wanted to go, and I just knew. Couldn't get to them. They're off the table. Yeah. The first two weeks I was there was more typical of January. I got some really good work done. You know, we, mm -hmm. we were talking earlier about your expectations for young dogs. Right. And, and you know. Um, I look at some of the things these young dogs do. First season, these dogs never been there. New birds, new terrain, new cover, new setting conditions. And mm -hmm. I think when some people take their puppies on the road to uh, what it, to them is a foreign land, brand new stuff. Sure. You know they've got a long time. Most of these most people plan their trips well in advance. Yeah. And human yeah. nature is for the mind to start to daydream about this puppy running around out there and just. It's going to be a, birds it's gonna be a gonna one be in a million. Up and, <laughs> or we walk and this, he's going to point this and point that. And you get mm -hmm. out there, and that's rare that that really happens on a late season wild bird hunt. Yeah. And unfamiliar everything unfamiliar, for yeah. the puppy. Yeah. Um, you, you know, if you catch a glimmer of good work here and there, that's good. That means you have right. a promising dog. And the youngest dog on the trip this year was. Gonna, that was my next question. Okay. Um, what was it? Yeah, how, how young was it? Uh, seven months. I had a seven-month-old setter puppy mm -hmm. on board. And before you got there, I had one run where she pointed a hen pheasant. She bumped a hen pheasant, pointed about four cottontail rabbits probably, and then at least 10, maybe closer to 15, uh, I, had, I don't know. It was some sort of a rodent. I, I'm sure mm. it wasn't the same kind of field mice we have here in Michigan. Cause but mole, vole. That mole, vole, some sort of ground rodent. Okay? Yeah. This all goes down about an hour workout. 
Yeah. And so uh, you do the math on that many points. I mean, every time I turn around, this dog is, you know, making game or pointing something. Mm -hmm. And I happened to have a cell signal that night driving home. That was the last spot of the day that she did that. And I checked in at home with my wife, and she asked how the day went, who I ran, how'd they do, and I told her about the puppy. And she goes, well, gosh, you're messing with me. I said, no, I, I couldn't be happier with that workout. And... <laughs> Not only did she not understand that statement, yeah. right? I'm looking at hey, you like, you what? Right? No, 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 let me explain <laughs> yeah, why, yeah. okay? So she's a seven-month-old puppy. He doesn't know anything, really. Mm -hmm. um, and I look back on it. You know what that tells me? It tells me this dog has a tremendous nose. And this tells me that that dog is absolutely hunting every step of the way out there at seven months old. She's going to sort the rest out. Right. And, and I remember watering her back at the truck and getting ready to pack things up for the day. And I thought, you know, I think that dog just might have found absolutely everything alive in her path on Today. that route wow. I took. When those skills get focused on game birds and she leaves all the other stuff alone, mm -hmm. that's going to be a really good dog. She's Yeah, yeah that's going to be a really good dog. And, and good, yeah, I would yeah. not have drawn that conclusion. So that's, but that's <laughs> where your expectations, you know, they're all going to bump birds, chase birds, and right. everything. Late season wild birds are not pushovers <clears throat> whatsoever. No. And so if they've made it that long, they've made it that long. There's a good chance they'll make it another day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, and sometimes you don't even see the tangible benefits immediately. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have thought day. of that as a tangible benefit when, until the way you said it. Yeah. I was like, wow, you're right. Yeah. No, uh, this uh, dog had uh, successes all over the place. Uh, yeah, and a lot of it, you know, that told me <clears throat> this dog is using, she has a very, very good nose, and she's using it 100% mm -hmm. of the time, and she is hunting. She's hunting for a lot of the wrong stuff right now. She doesn't know that yet. Right. She will. She'll yeah. figure that out. She's a little big puppy. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um. That's good. And then what was the oldest dog? I mean, you probably took every just about no, every dog. No, I'm trying to think. The oldest dog probably would have been... Oldest pointing dog was four. I know that. And then probably our cocker, who I think is six now, was the, okay. old, the oldest dog was our cocker. Right. Yeah. And I got to hunt with her. Yeah, we, we ran that big old pheasant area area with her. Yeah, with her and a lab. We put two flushers on the ground because there's tons of tall... There was tons of hen pheasants in there. There were tons of hen pheasants. Those two had a ball. I could have shot my limit on hen pheasants. <laughs> what is the limit on hen pheasants anyway? Oh, it's zero. Zero. So actually, I did shoot my limit of hen pheasants that day. But I got to Those really dogs watch. Had a ball in it, there. It, gave me, it gave me this little excitement thing about what Taffy can do someday, not like what she did in South Dakota, what that purpose is for that breed of dog. Mm -hmm. It was like, wow. It was all within shooting range. Yeah. Your control over them when we had across the creek was like sit, sit, and they both. I don't know. Do they sit better than pointing dogs? Is it just something no. about a flesh? Because those two listened like, boom, boom. Yeah, you had to. You had to. That was it. Get around something. Yeah, and yep. you just stopped them. I was yeah. like, wow. Yeah. And uh, and I watched. I watched each of them get into a, a finger of cover and and blow a hen. I mean, it gave me a beautiful right to left crossing shot. <clears throat> that I did not take. Don't worry. Don't worry. We don't do that. But uh, I, watching those work in there, I was like, th that, you know, I'm forever going to be happy if I can get Taffy to do that sure. someday. Yeah, you'll get it's like, there. That's, For sure. It made me think about what Glenn Blackwood said. It's like he considers his, his Cocker Spaniels the infielders. Like, mm -hmm. we're, just, we're playing in this field today. This is a, a small ballpark. Yeah. This is where I hunt them. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go hunt them out on the, you know, the the rugby field. Right. I'm hunting them in the infield right here, you know. It just that really was fun to watch. Yeah. And yeah. if you look that particular piece of ground mm -hmm. is a would be a terrible pointing dog hunt. I, I don't think there's any pointing dog that could do a good job in there and have a good hunt. You get extremely lucky and maybe sure. get a bird to hold on the edge, but by and large that that goes back to picking the right tool for the job, the right yeah. dog for the hunt and right. the cover. That place, and, and it's a place I've been on for 17 years. Um, you know, landowner has other stuff in that area right. too. But that particular quarter section, 
um, it's it's a flushing dog spot. But you you wouldn't you'd pass on it otherwise. I, if you did have, I wouldn't run a pointing dog right, in there. Right. Yeah. If I didn't have any flushing yeah. dogs on the truck, I'd skip it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. And I guess we should be in full disclosure. Talk about our our prairie chicken hunt. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, my listeners was, like to know that I'm not infallible. You're human. <laughs> you're human. So and self-deprecating. Of your four days there. Yeah. We had one day where I felt we might have a chance today, and I right. I, I knew that if if we're going to try it, that was the day to try right. it. Right. Yeah. And. So for me, that means I like sunshine mm -hmm. and warmer, relatively speaking, relatively. for January. Not warm, but... It was but a really pleasant afternoon yeah. that day. There wasn't you much You weren't wind. sweating walking and you weren't cold walking. No, it was nice. I don't know. It might have hit 40 that day. I yeah. don't know what it was. It felt nice because there was mm -hmm. almost very little wind. Right. And this, we had sun. Yep. And um, so we hunted that in the afternoon. Yep. Another spot I've been saving for my buddy Ron, <laughs> and, and over the years it's been a really reliable. Uh, it's a you know all. It's one of your go tos. Go to places for chickens, and it's all native prairie pasture land. Yeah. Yep. And, and this year, um, they were wet, so there was good grass in the pasture still. Right. Uh, and, and which helps hold. Well, you, you, it helps. The chickens will use them either way, but it, right. it, it helps, helps us, us because they got a little cover. They got a little cover. They got a little cover to work with. Yeah. One less, one less, one less weapon that yeah. they have on their side of sight. Yeah. If they're behind a cover line, you know they're 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 kind of going to wait it out, I guess, or they're, they're going to keep loafing, I guess. You right. You just you just hope you get lucky. I mean. That's all. Well, we kind of had both. So. We did. We did because you got to see a little bit of both. You got yeah. to see, you know, what you could. Ex I don't want anyone to think you're going to be overly successful trying to hunt any of the the prairie grouse. Uh, Let alone in uh, January. No, no, <laughs> in January is yeah, yeah. late yeah. season. It's yeah. usually a losing proposition right. walking with bird dogs. And you're and, mostly going to get long distance mm -hmm. liftoffs, which we had some of. I think right when we left the truck. Oh, we did. Yep. We did. I, I just happened to look up, and there's three of them yep. out, you know, three, 400 yards. Yeah. You know, off Then a few go. more bailed in that same in area. Same general vicinity. Yeah. Yep. A couple more. And uh, and then we had. We had, we had a point. Yeah, we had a point that I got to walk up on. Yeah. After, yeah. after birds flew away, at, which talks about your cover, that area had a lot of cover in it because I had, I winged a bird. And in the degree of finding this bird in this cut, it was like, wow. Well, this no. is. I, I mean, there was good grass in there, but it's not like pheasant cover. No, no, no. But it was not like that prairie that you're saying in some other years. Oh, where it's You, really you would have seen that bird well, running I, away sometimes. Yeah. And, right. And as I look back on that, that you're that point yeah. where you did get close enough yeah. and we knocked a bird down. I'm almost sure that late bird that got that up. Late bird, that late bird. That it bird. almost has to it be. It has to be like, because we scoured that place. We gave and, it. And I've done it before. I, I've knocked birds down, and, you know, we always say, well, we know they're not dead when they're falling. Right, right. right. So you kind of say wings. It's but, a controlled crash. But it is. And it, some of those, you know, sharp tails and chickens doesn't take a whole lot to knock them down. Mm -hmm. But I have seen them get up again. They don't, if you break any part of a wing, obviously sure. they can't. Can't fly. But I've seen them come down and, and just get their wits about them. A I've seen doves. Bit. I've seen doves do it. Have in, you? Oh, ten times. And I've seen a dove fall out of the sky, go to pick it up, and it fly away. And yeah, if a dove can do it. And just looking back at that, and just to play it safe, we oh we scoured. We, we scoured it. I didn't. If there was a bird down, if there was a way to get alive, back to the truck, we, you said I'll I'll go let well, ten dogs out here. Yeah, yeah, we couldn't we couldn't get a truck close enough right. to do that on that road, but. Um, I mean, we just did several loops in there. And looking back on it, I thought that, Bigger was, and that was your bird. Yeah. He, he yeah, I, I got to believe it, too, it, he, because, that, in fact, that whole flock pretty much got up and went away and right. Mm -hmm. And like a late, like some birds, you know, fly late once you get to her. This was much later than late. Well, and he was a little wonky when he first got a little And you wobbly. said that he I did said, not. Something in right. There was not a healthy takeoff on and, that bird. And he was too close to the other ones that got up. He would have lifted with them. 
right. a January prairie chicken isn't like one of them is just going to mm -hmm. lay back and, oh, let's see if yeah. old Ron and Justin <laughs> walk. Go. Yeah, 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 no, that, no. Yeah, and that, that actually kind of made me feel better. Yeah. Like, maybe there's a good chance that bird, And, and just, you know. I, I, I think you just shook him enough to get him out yeah. of the ground. He got his wits back about right. him and off he went because we did not and and, and, and some birds do, like you said. It's almost like the, a guy that can take a punch and a guy that can't take a punch. Mm -hmm. There are birds that get hit by a BB, and they go down. Pheasants aren't one of them. No. But woodcock. I mean, I, I sometimes wonder where the BB hit. You know, I'm like, what's the matter with you? You look perfectly healthy, you know. Um, but I, I've got to tell, like, I've got to truncate the rest of the story. So we did a really good job of scouring. We're 99% sure that late bird got up. It, where we were standing and everything, it would have made sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then we continued to walk. And, and of course, I have this problem of like every half an hour or so, I like to stop and have a cigarette. Well, that's not always conducive when you're hunting. Not always a good idea. <laughs> but, again, I'm me, and I'm not out there to kill. I don't, I don't hate the birds. I just love my friends and the walks and the dogs. And uh, so we're coming up this fence, and now I can, how far was the truck when we were getting back? 200 yards? About 200, let's, say, let's say 200 yards. So we kind of, there's no point in walking down the fence. We might as well take the angle to the truck and we cut off. Done. We were, we're done. done we're, we're, we were done. We were done. The wind was no longer in our favor either. Well, that didn't really, that's no, not no, a but I mean, for the like, hunt. But, but it was just different. It for was me, just like, it was because that was the same route we walked out. Well, yeah. A and so for Ooh. me, we were just, we were, we're done. just, we're going back we're to the truck. Over our old foot tracks. Over. Right. Yep. So. I stand and I go, well, this would be a great time to have cigarettes then. And I proceed to light one, put it, put the pack away, and just uh, how far away were those those chickens? So I'm, we're walking side by side. Right, right. I, I'm not carrying a gun. Right. And I, I was shocked how how, how close they had let us walk. Right. In. Right. Twenty five yards. Yeah, I, I was gonna say between twenty and thirty yards. Yeah, twenty five yards and. <clears throat> Five chickens just jump right up, right in our face. <laughs> right. And, I mean. And I'm expecting, bam, bam, <laughs> right? And so there's this little pause, and I thought. I haven't heard anything. Perhaps he thinks it's five hen pheasants. So <laughs> I yell, chickens. <laughs> and I look over. I'll let you and, take it from there. And I was just taking a drag with my right hand. <laughs> <laughs> and holding the, I'm left-handed, so I'm holding the grip of the gun in my left hand, and I look at the birds, <laughs> and I stick the cigarette in my mouth, and I go to mount the gun, and I realize I'm going to put the cigarette right into my chin, so I grab the cigarette back <laughs> out of my mouth, and I grab it, so I, now I've got the forearm in my right hand, looking like Michael McIntosh, <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, I don't know how far it's, away it's they were. Over. How far away were they by the time I, 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 I did the, the cigarette juggle? <laughs> you can't give up three seconds. Oh, no, no, no. Right, and it was all of one Mississippi, two Mississippi, before I got this. about that. Yeah. yeah. But, and, but now they're 60. <laughs> and I let some BBs go out of frustration. Right. And I told Justin, never tell anybody this story. <laughs> You so, brought it up. I know I did. I want to because I, I think that that's what, to me, this has always been about. Yeah. Having fun on trips. It having was. laughs. Yeah. We'll um, both remember you're that. Ne you're yeah. never going to remember getting stuck in the mud. You're never going to remember me lighting a mm -hmm. cigarette. You might forget about the bird you shot when nobody was there that week. You might That might not sure. stick in your memory yeah. bank. Yeah. But that's why I love doing this. That's why I love talking to people. That's why I love doing this podcast. Yeah. Because... No one's going to brag about a roller coaster ride before they die. They're not going to go, you know, there was this one time I was a great American, 1977. Wow, is that a great look? You like you are ready for the pillow. Mm -hmm. But if you're still telling stories about your hunting trips mm -hmm. and they just get better every year, I told Justin, in fact, on the way out, I says, you know how this is going to play out. Next time I tell the story next year, it's going to be Justin said, hey, Ron, this would be a good time for a cigarette. <laughs> and the following year, it would be, hey, Ron, why don't you let me have one of those cigarettes? <laughs> and then I'll actually blame it because I was shaking a cigarette out of the pack for Justin, who decided to start smoking that day. And it'll go from 200 <laughs> yards from the truck to 20, 20 yards. yards. Oh, yeah. Truck. This story only builds its own gravy. <laughs> All right, Justin, thanks for finishing up these questions. You thanks bet. for the yep. invite to Kansas. Sure. More adventures to come, everybody. See ya.